Sunday evening at 5 o'clock, now that we've changed our hours uh, to later Thursday. We had a, an exciting Thursday, first Thursday evening yesterday. Um, we've always had our first Fridays and our It's Fridays, um, but uh, we're hoping to diversify that. And so until 5 p.m. On, on Sunday, you can continue to see Crossing Cultures bring as many people as possible this weekend. I know you've all enjoyed it hugely, and we've had a lot of programming. Um, Will Owen here and Harvey Wagner here. Um, gave 435 works to Dartmouth College, of which we have 120 works here on display. So I think the first thing we should do is express our appreciation to them. <laughs> Will, this evening, is going to be in conversation with Henry Skerritt, so let me tell you a little bit about both of them. Um, Will Owen um, is the Associate University Librarian and particularly for technical services and systems at the University of Library, the University Library in Chapel Hill, the University of North Carolina, in Chapel Hill, in North Carolina. And uh, he is a very distinguished librarian, but a great, great collector of uh, contemporary Aboriginal art with Harvey Wagner, who is a distinguished professor at the same university. And um, their gifting to Dartmouth College has been one of the great examples of philanthropy, certainly in American art museums, but in a most distinguished way uh, for Australian art, and in particular um, Australian Aboriginal art. Henry Skerritt uh, is here with his wife Lydia, and Henry is over at the University of Pittsburgh um, currently. He is uh, an art historian, he's a curator, he's a songwriter. Uh, he hails from Perth uh, in Western Australia, so he has, like me, an accent. Um, but his is a little bit different. And so his interests are around Australian Aboriginal art, um, around identity and cultural transaction, and he's written extensively about Aboriginal art and culture. And he's going to begin by making a presentation to you. Um, but uh, perhaps I'll ask either Henry or Will to explain sort of the fashion of what they've devised, which is a nature of conversation between them, opened up with a slide presentation. Um, but going to involve you as well. So I'm going to invite Henry just to get things going and to take over so that I can sit back and relax like you. So enjoy. Wow, well, well firstly, uh, thank you all for coming out. Uh, it's quite dedicated to come to a, a discussion on contemporary Aboriginal art on a Friday evening. Uh, and I guess that means, hopefully, that all of you have seen the show, um, that you've all enjoyed it. Um, hopefully some of you might have even picked up the, uh, the wonderful catalogue, uh, which is, um, I've been continually uh, delving into as a, as a pretty remarkable reference, uh, reference book. Um, so thank you for coming, but I'd also like to thank, um, I'd like to thank the museum for hosting this uh, amazing show. Because um, it's a really gutsy thing for an American museum to put on a show of uh, contemporary Aboriginal paintings. Uh, it's very, uh, I would think it's a very forward, forward looking thing. And so what Will and I were thinking is that we'd have a little discussion. And uh, I've titled it, uh, Just What Is It That Makes Australian Aboriginal Art So Appealing, So Contemporary? Does anyone get the, get the reference? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I, I cannot claim it as my own, it's, uh, it's, it's borrowed from Richard Hamilton. Uh, so this is the, the, the question that we'd like to address today. What is it that makes Aboriginal art so contemporary? Um, and, uh, and the way that we thought we'd do it is we're just going to have a kind of an informal uh, discussion. And uh, I've put up some slides just to kind of give it a shape. Will is going to uh, interrupt every time he thinks uh, we've lost direction. But what we'd also like to invite you to do is, um, is also to interject. If you think, uh, if you think we've strayed, we're being uh, excessively obtuse, um, I would love you to uh, raise your hand and uh, interject, uh, ask any questions that you like, because what we really want to do here uh, is approach a question that, that I don't think is resolved. I don't think, I don't think that there is a, there's an answer. But hopefully, by the end of End of end of 35 minutes, we'll have, we'll have reached the uh, the bottom of this question. So I thought the place to start is contemporary, contemporary art, contemporary art. What do we?
think of. I mean, even if you don't know Aboriginal art, most of you have an idea of what contemporary art is, and it tends to look something like this. Uh, it's either got pickled sharks or um, giant, ridiculous puppy dogs or... Um, this, is, this is a beautiful work, um, Maria Romney. Or, if you're lucky, it's very easy to identify contemporary art because it's the gallery's labeled contemporary, right? So it's the ones with, with Chuck Close and Anselm Kiefer. Easy, right? That's contemporary art, right? Right? Well, I'm going to say it's not, right? Because with all uh, due respect, I'm actually going to say that most of this work is not really that contemporary. It might have been reproduced recently, but I think most of this work is still engaged with what I would call modernity, uh, which makes most of this work modernist, modernist work. <coughs> and so instead of clarifying what contemporary art is, I've just gone and introduced a whole other problem. Right? What, is, what is modernism? Well, to me, modernism is very straightforward. Modernist art is art that is essentially connected um, to modernity. It's engaged with modernity. What's modernity? Modernity is a cultural period, we can say starts or sometime maybe around the 16th century. It's still going um, in places like America. Um, it's a cultural epoch, I'm sure you'd recognize that it has been characterized by industrialization, nationalism, invention of mass media, the printing press. Um, Historical time, I think historical time is a big invention of, of modernism. And so the artists of the modern era have been artists really trying to, to tackle the questions of their age, those modern questions. Well, what I'd like to argue is that now we're coming out of modernism. And, and there's reasons for that, that that are pretty apparent to everyone. Um, globalization would be a big one. Um, the rise of, um, of third world powers like um, Brazil, China, India. Um, you know, we're starting to see the world differently. We're entering into an era that, you know, for better or worse, is, uh, is, is contemporary. And what do I mean by contemporary? Well, um, the dictionary offers, offers a pretty... I know that's a, it's always a dull way to do it. But the dictionary <laughs> offers a pretty good, a pretty good way of, of looking at it. It gives you two definitions. Living or occurring at the same time, belonging to or occurring in the present. Okay, so... And you can see, actually, from the etymology, that really the meaning of this word contemporary hasn't, hasn't actually changed from the Latin. You know, together with and in time. <coughs> right? So, uh, if, if that's what contemporary is, what's contemporary art? Well, again, I've just borrowed, uh, I've borrowed uh, a definition from a fellow Pittsburgher, uh, Terry Smith. He says, contemporary art is, perhaps for the first time in history, truly an art of the world. It comes from the whole world, and it tries to imagine the world as a differentiated, yet inevitably connected whole. This is the definition of diversity, and it's the key characteristic of contemporary art, as it is of contemporary life in the world today. And I'm going to interrupt for a moment and say, in that <coughs> definition of contemporary that Henry had up a moment ago, there is <coughs> the tension and complexities of our contemporary society. And I just want you to hang on to those those words, tension and complexities, because I think they have a lot to do with what we're going to see and talk about. Yeah, thank you. So really, you know, let's 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 another down into a takeaway, right? A little, you know, the one line, my dad, my dad is uh, he's a he's a he's a psychiatrist and he's tried as much as he can to grasp this. You know, what's modern, what's contemporary thing. He, said, he just couldn't get it. So he said, just give it to me in one line. And I thought about it and I said, well, Ezra Pound says that, you know, to be modern, you make it new. Okay? So modern is make it new. Contemporary is make it now. Right? That's the big difference. Contem modern is to new, as contemporary is to now. Nowness, presentness, the key elements of contemporary art. And I wanted to, oh, sorry. So, I got a little tree happy. So, what does it mean to show Aboriginal art as contemporary art? When I said that, I, th I started to kind of think about early examples of um, the, the exhibition of Aboriginal art as contemporary art. And this is the one that people always talk about. It's 1989, uh, a major exhibition organised 
uh, by the Pompidou in, in Paris. Um, uh, a curator by Jean Hubert Martin is called uh, Magicians de la Terre, Magicians of the Earth. And uh, this image is, 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 is much reproduced. It's a, it's a Yundamu sand painting alongside a rigid lock. And it, it's reproduced because it's stunning. It's, it looks, look how amazing these two things look. The problem is that these two works really have absolutely nothing at all in common. Um, and so what's happening here is that these two works, which are visually similar, are being kind of crammed together in a, in a way that really, really doesn't, doesn't achieve anything but subordinate one to this kind of museum environment. OK, and I'm going to argue with Henry just a little bit on this case. Um, I recently read, uh, and I hope this is true, that the Walbury men who did the ground painting gave Richard Long the mud that he used to create the wall painting. And again, as we get deeper into this conversation, um, the notion of Aboriginal artists reaching out and trying to uh, bring their culture, make us aware of their culture, give us their culture as a key motivating force in the creation of their art. I like to see that adumbrated a little bit um, by these Walbury men giving Richard the mud with which to make his modern painting. Well, well, you know, and I think that I think that that, it, that you know utterly shows that these artists are working in a very contemporary manner at this this point in time. They're thinking about um, cross cultural exchange, different ways of seeing the world. Um, you know, I think I think that actually that kind of munip the munificence of that gesture I think is one of the key defining uh, elements of, of contemporary Aboriginal art. So I was trying to think of a non-Indigenous uh, work that, that also really uh, embodied these, uh, these ideas. And this was the one that, that kind of came to me. Uh, it's a work by uh, a Cuban-born American artist, Felix Gonzalez Torres. And it's kind of a beautiful, elegant, very simple work. It's two clocks. And he just sets them at exactly the same time. And you can imagine what begins to happen over time. Right? One of them might be slightly faster, the other might be slightly slower. But what we've got here is this classic embodiment of the age in which we live in, in which despite sharing the same world, it's possible to exist in different times. It's possible to, um, you know, and that's, that's really the, 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 the tension of contemporary that, that I think Will was alluding to earlier. Okay, so how does that differ? How, does, how, how, how might we think, start to think about this slightly differently? Um, would you, do you want to talk about this one? No, go ahead. Uh, well, this is a work, I, uh, um, it's, uh, it's at um, uh, uh, Brian's old, old uh, joint at uh, the National Gallery of Australia. But I included this one because, interestingly, this was uh, included in the Sydney um, Biennale in 1988. So this was actually before Magicians de la Terre. And again, it shows how contemporary these artists uh, are. Because what this work here is, it's called the, uh, the Aboriginal Memorial. And it's 200, uh, it's 200 burial poles, hollow, hollow log um, coffins. Um, so there was one uh, for every year of European colonization of Australia. So it was presented in 1988 which was uh, you know, a year that was saturated in, um, uh, in, in the kind of historical reevaluations of the Australian bicentenary. But here's a, a group of artists, and they're doing something here that is extraordinarily um, powerful. They're presenting the persistence of indigenous culture, um, but recognizing uh, that, that it persists within another world. It persists um, within a world in which um, indigenous culture uh, is superimposed, uh, indigenous uh, colonial culture has been kind of superimposed uh, on the Australian landscape, but they're pointing out that, in fact, in the 200 years, uh, indigenous uh, ways of being have persisted. But look at this, it's gorgeous, right? It's stunningly, stunningly beautiful. So this isn't, you know, this isn't, um, this isn't a slogan, this isn't didactic, this isn't, you know, I'm trying to think of the most didactic Aboriginal art you can imagine, but there are some, you know, um, uh, Vernon Arkey, who's represented upstairs, I went and saw a show of his, 
uh, some work in our bottle work, he has these big placards that say things like, my, you know, what is it? my job is to tolerate you, yours is to, my job is to tolerate you, yours is to accept me, so you know, he, the, the, he likes these big, big slogans. This isn't a slogan, this is, this is trying to win you over with a kind of a persuasive affect. It's trying to actually, uh, it's trying to get you to think about um, the persistence and beauty of indigenous culture uh, and different ways of seeing the world um, the, the, at, at the same time as these kind of universalist modernist ideas are, are, are dominating uh, the uh, certainly dominating the power structures. <coughs> so we, we wanted to kind of think about the key differences here, the key differences. Um, that make Aboriginal art um, contemporary, that make Aboriginal artists so um, adept at negotiating this kind of this status of contemporaneity. And I thought this was kind of a, a neat um, painting to think about. Uh, it's um, a very lovely work in, in the collection here. And I thought we could compare it to one of the works in the show upstairs, because they're both square, right? And um, except that this one's a much larger square than that one. See, who says visual analysis is dead? Um, okay, so the reason I picked these two works is that we've got two works that are both interested in weather. But they're both interested in weather in, in, in really quite a different way. It's representing a very different um, ontological view uh, and, and a very different view um, to what painting can do. So does anyone know why Monet painted weather? He was a very fond of Okay. Um, what's the next one? I mean, does anyone know why the Impressionists are called the Impressionists? Yeah, right. So Impressionists are interested um, uh, in in these in in um, <coughs> transitory effects, effects of light, effects of weather, uh, effects of um, yeah, light and weather. They're really the, the big ones. And and so Monet, so oh, exactly. Yeah. So Monet says. Now, Monet says it's impossible to paint the the landscape, the real world, right? So what I'm looking for, he says, are those those most transitory moments, whether uh, envelope is the term he uses, those things that get between the um, the motif and the eye. He says that's what's real, right? That's what's real. It's the sense of seeing. And what he's getting at, you know, what he's really getting at is this kind of, you know, it's a very modern kind of idea. This this idea that. Um, a painting is always going to be a representation. So he's looking for things that make the nature of that um, uh, representation of this, the nature of its non-reality, most apparent. That's why he's really interested in weather. <coughs> it's not a, a hard step to see somebody who's interested in, in weather for its kind of transitory elements leading into uh, artists like um, you know, Mark Rothko and Jacques Pollock who are really interested in um, the autonomy of the representation, painting something that is is not um, a representation of something, but is a thing in itself. You know, that's what Clement Greenberg says about about modernist painting. He says they don't paint um, they don't paint things. A modernist painting is a thing in itself. A modernist artist is like a god. He creates the things. Right? <laughs> uh, the emphasis was mine, but uh, they're, they're roughly his words. Um, so there's this fundamental idea here that. This is a representation, but it, and a representation is not a real landscape. And that's one of the ideas that I think we really have to kind of get beyond if we're going to think about Aboriginal art. Um, because I think that for somebody like Kathleen Pajara, painting weather is not um, evidence of, um, it's not evident, it's not something that is reveals the kind of inability to capture the landscape over its change. But actually, weather is something that strikes at the very core of the essence of the landscape. And here we get to that kind of cagey question of the dreaming, um, right? it's a, which is you know, one of the kind of mind-bendingly difficult concepts um, in, in Aboriginal art, which is that, uh, where should we start with the dreaming? Well, uh, what I like to start with the dreaming, um, is something that Vali Karawana said when he was here <clears throat> a little over a month ago. Um, we were um, <clears throat> meeting with the uh, museum's docents, and that 
what is the dreaming is a question that uh, frequently <coughs> the docents get asked. And while he said, think of the dreaming as this vast reservoir that contains everything that ever was, ever will be, uh, and, and what we, what is the present moment is something that is drawn out from that, that reservoir and it's a particular instantiation of what exists in the dreaming. And so I think where, where Henry is going here is that this, this depiction of a hailstorm, the landscape, the way that the landscape is changed <coughs> by the weather at this moment is that, that unique individual instantiation of a hailstorm in the desert, but it is intrinsically related to what exists in the dreaming. The hailstorm that is referred to perhaps in an ancestral time becomes present again in our time, in our landscape, in Kathleen's country as she's painted it <coughs> now. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, uh, that's a perfect summary, right? So um, I'll just try and muddy that up. Um, <laughs> now, so, and I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use, so, you know, if we think about Monet saying that, um, you know, the, 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 that you can only ever know the sense of the world, you can only ever know the phenomena of the world, you can't know the real world. Well, in, 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 and that's why he paints weather. And Kathleen's painting, she's painting weather because She's saying, in fact, the weather is is the is the way. It's the sign of that allows us to access the the essence, the dreaming. Right? So, so in fact, rather than being something that reveals transitoriness, it actually the, it reveals permanence. Permanence, yeah, perfect. Uh, the, just a close up for those of you who haven't seen this work. I mean, it's a very delicate, beautiful, um, elegant work. But one of the problems with this, this idea of dreaming is, um, one of the difficulties with this idea of dreaming is that it, um, it, it, it's constantly adaptive as well. It's, so it's permanent, but it's also transitory. So, you know, the, the, the great illustration of this is the artist Patty Bedford, whose works um, upstairs, and uh, really one of the, uh, the great uh, innovators of uh, contemporary Aboriginal art. And so Bedford paints this work, uh, he paints it in 1999, it's the Emu Dreaming at Mount King, a site that he's um, quite, uh, that, that he has an um, ancestral connection to and a responsibility for. But it's also a site um, which uh, Will writes in the catalog beautifully, has a bloody coda uh, that um, on this site, um, the, uh, a group of his kinsmen were killed around, around 1920. Uh, and their bodies were burnt um, by the station owners in retaliation for them spearing the cattle. So, although Bedford paints this painting in 1999 showing the dreaming story, and the dreaming story is that the uh, ancestral Inu and the ancestral turkey pass through this place, and the turkey get, uh, the Inu gets stuck right here in this spot, uh, in a crevice, and because he stops, the turkey makes camp, thus separating day from night. So it's a big creation story. Um, uh, and because he paints that, in painting that landscape, that landscape that um, you know still bears, you know, that was shaped by the ancestral passage, that still bears the residue of the ancestors. The problem is that because it, it registers all occurrences on that space, it also has to register the scars of colonial history. So a few years later, oh, sorry, very sensitive. Maybe, uh, so a few years later, he paints this work, uh, and it's the same scene. And you can almost make them out. You can make out that you know that the ridge runs down the middle, and you've still got these two uh, mountains looking down. But what you can see is that he slightly shifted the perspective upwards. So the spot where the emu gets trapped, which is here now comes up here. And the reason that he's done that is to make room for this circle, which is the spot where the men's 
bodies were burnt. It's a rather horrific story, um, and, and these are, I think, are, are, are extremely sombre and, and moving paintings. Um, but a few years after he paints this third one, this is just a slightly different, more aerial view of the same scene, but he paints this one, and it's, it's utterly blank. All you get is this waver of dots around the edge. Now, what do we make of this? I mean, this this looks, you know, coming from here to here, it looks, you know, it looks like an artist delving deeply into abstraction. It looks like he's making a, a non-objective painting. Um, you know, I, I mean, I you would say it's almost impossible to see how that could represent the site of the Bedford Downs massacre. And this comes to my point that whereas a Monet is always going to be a representation, this whole idea of representation being separated from reality is one that is rooted in, in modernism. That painting is indexical of the, the landscape. It's not, um, it's not representational. It's indexical. What do I mean by that? I mean that um, towards the end of his life, Paddy Bedford says, um, Paddy Bedford says, I've painted all of my mother's country. I've painted all my father's country. Now I'm just painting. Now, if you want to read him as a modernist, you go, great, he's painting non-objective paintings. He's painting paintings that have nothing. He's just painting. But I think the way that you have to read that is that what he's saying is, I've painted my father's <coughs> country. I've painted my mother's country. In doing so, I've asserted all of my authority over those countries. They're now you know, my country. And so if anything I paint, you know, because I am connected to that country, because the dreaming for that country runs through me, it's going to be, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's all connected. It's one single index of, of country, place, person. They're all united. And they're united in ways that it's really kind of hard to think through when we're so used to looking at paintings and thinking of them as representations. Maybe the word that I would throw in here rather than representation is that they are manifestations of the country. They are um, epiphanies of the country in that they are a literal showing forth of what, what is there. Um, they don't, you know, if you break representation down, it is presentation, again, it's re-presentation. <coughs> Um, that's not what Aboriginal painting is doing. It is making manifest in the world the dreaming, the artist's connection to it, and so on. Mm, I think that's right. I think enactment or manifestation, I think an enactment of the dream, I think that's a really nice way. Um, I think we should, I think we, I'm just going to make one last point and, and then I think we should throw it open to questions. Um, and the point that I was going to make is, um, that all sounds really, really complicated, okay. right? It makes this work sound really daunting, really, actually, really tough, really difficult. How could, how could, you know, how, how do I expect people to enjoy this? And I've already said that I think these works are extremely munificent. And what I'd like to kind of put out before, you know, before we, it gets too scary, is that in making these enactments of dreaming. What these artists are actually offering um, is a presentation of the elemental power of the landscape, right? Of something. So, you know, I, I've often wondered, I'm just going to skip through to the door and read, but I've often wondered, you know, um, would people think of Aboriginal art as more contemporary if it was a little uglier? Right? Like, is, because these works are so beautiful, like, they are so stunningly beautiful. And I, I, I realized recently that, that these works have to be stunningly beautiful because of what they're trying to do, right? This work is, is trying to enact all of the power of the landscape, right? And it's a power that they can see in the shifting of the light, in the blossoming of the, the desert blooms, in the, um, in the movement of sand dunes. All of those things are enactments of this spiritual power. That's the, all of that visual activity on the landscape reveals the essence of uh, the, the power of the landscape, right? So that's, that's what this work is trying to do. And so it has to be beautiful, right? It has to be beautiful because what it's trying to do is occupy you. It's trying to, um, 
it's trying to it's trying to just hit you with the utter self-evidence of what these people are, are communicating. Uh, so one way I would I would put out when thinking of these is that these are not um, sentinels that uh, are there standing guard trying to protect their culture against the onslaught of colonialism. You know, these are not defensive paintings. These are actually, you know, these are like occupying forces. And the point of them is to travel out into the world, to Toledo, to Dartmouth, and to, to kind of impress upon you with, with you know, this purely effective um, visual power. Uh, it's trying to affect you to realize just how powerful this landscape is. So they're not scary paintings, they're quite the, they're quite the opposite. And so, to try to sum that up, um, you know, this, this sense, I like Henry's word of munificence. Um, Australia is an, is an occupied country. Uh, it was colonized by the British 200 years ago. Um, what has happened in the last 40 years with the, um, the explosion of painting for the contemporary art market by Aboriginal people is they have seized a chance, they've seized a moment to, after 200 years almost of living, uh, of having their country occupied by white men, of living with the civilization that the white man brought to them, it, what, what Aboriginal artists are saying here is, this is my culture. It is still alive, it is still meaningful. It will be alive because it is of the dreaming. It is eternal. Uh, it's that word that we've all come to love. Uh, it's everywhere. Um, and there is a vital need for Aboriginal people to make us understand that, to make us understand that their culture is alive, is vibrant, is a meaningful part of the world today. And painting and sculpture, the works that you see upstairs, are the means that they have chosen, that they deem the most effective way of communicating that to us. And so this really, this painting is in many ways a gift from the Aboriginal people to the Western world in particular. Um, and that, that after, you know, after my own experience, as Henry says, of being just blown away by the beauty of it, um, what has, has given this persistence for Harvey and and me over, you know, it's close to 25 years now since we first saw this work and, and it really literally did change our lives. It was a life-changing event to encounter this work for the first time, was the way that it opened up Aboriginal culture in a much deeper and broader sense for me, the way that it could be um, contemporary and partake of um, of our world, of our Western world, of acrylic painting on canvas, and yet be utterly expressive of the um, eternal qualities of the dreaming and the way that those two things coexist uh, at the same time is part of what has always fascinated me about this art, and and you see it in so many ways in contemporary Aboriginal culture. Um, uh, there's, there's been a lot in the news recently because a very important man from uh, uh, the uh, Yolmu people of Northeast Ireland land recently passed away, uh, a man uh, named Yun Ping. Um, and <laughs> He was the lead singer in a rock and roll band called Yoto Yindi. Um, and one of the things that I love about Yoto Yindi, again, getting into this sort of politics, um, Australia is one of the few 
countries in the world that was colonized and taken over, and, and there has never been a treaty between the occupying nation and the occupied uh, peoples. Uh, here in America, we have, whatever you think of them, made many treaties with the Native Americans, with the, the, the Maumee and the Kickapoo, on uh, whose lands we are now sitting and talking about indigenous art. Um, there's never been a treaty in Australia, um, despite the fact that Aboriginal people have never called, have never ceased calling for that treaty. For, because the treaty <coughs> recognizes the existence and the contemporaneity of the two cultures in the same land. And so one of Yunapingu's greatest hits, literally, uh, for, for the band Yoti Indi, is a song called Treaty, which is all about how the planting of the Union Jack never changed our land. It's almost a direct quote from the song. But, but, but the way that, that that gets embodied in the band is Yoti Indi has both Aboriginal musicians in it and non-Aboriginal, white fellow musicians in it. And they play electric guitars and they play didgeridoos. And when you listen to Treaty, you're, you're, you hear them singing, this land was never bought and sold, this land was never given up. And then the next thing you know, they're singing in Yomamata in their own language and they're saying essentially the same thing. And it just keeps flipping back and forth between the two poles as these paintings do. And, and again, I just come back over and over again to this, what this art represents is a serious concerted attempt to bring their culture into our world. And what Henry was saying before, with, with Rothko uh, or artists like that, the, the painting is that object in and of itself created by the artist. It, 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 it's almost... Well, it's a world you know, unto itself. It's, thank you. It's a world unto itself. And, and Aboriginal art is, is antithetical. It means to bring that world out into you, into our world. Yeah, I, I would go. You know, I would go even further to say that you know part of part of what makes these two paintings so radically different, um, uh, and these have been paired for a, for a very particular reason, which is that there is a, an often quoted um, uh, incident where uh, Robert Thomas visited um, the National Gallery of Australia with with Wally Caruana, and he saw Mark Rothko, and uh, he said, "Do you want to?" Who's that bugger that paints like me? He says. And I, I, I think to be charitable, Rebro, I kind of wonder whether you. I, I think he was being very polite to Mark Rothko, really. Um, and and even Wally has, has has subsequently spent 20 years kind of pondering what on earth Rebro could have meant because when you compare them, and this is an unfair comparison because this one's blue. Um, what you always see with Aboriginal art is that it pushes outwards. It pushes outwards, both um, both in terms of the, the formal arrangements, but also in terms of in terms of um, its its worldview. It's it's this painting here, Mark Rothko, is trying to suck you in. He, he makes it so big that it takes up your entire field of vision, because he wants to create for you a, a world that is totally autonomous from the real world, totally detached from the real world. It's a world that is tragic and timeless, he says. Rover is painting something that is, is really part of the world. It is an enactment of the world. It, it is directly linked to the world and it contributes to the world. So it's utterly outward looking. It's doing the exact opposite thing uh, to a Mark Rothko, I would, I would think. OK, we have gone far longer than we thought. Um, and haven't heard anything from you. Uh, so we still have about 15 minutes left on the hour, I think. Um, your comments, your questions, your arguments. Yes, sir. Um, 
we look at um, contemporary art through the lens of um, all our experiences of abstract art and um, cubism and things like that. And I was wondering, in a way, the ab uh, Aboriginal contemporary art, how much that has been influenced? Because if this had been brought up at the end of the 19th century, I think it would have been a very different audience out there who wouldn't have necessarily known how to even look at it, begin to look at it. Um, so is the question, um, I mean, has there been an influence on well, I was wondering if, again, yeah, there's two ways. I mean, in some of these, the pointillism, to some extent, looks like pixelated computer um, mm -hmm. images, to some extent, and whether that would might have been something that influenced the pointillism of some of the art, for instance. So, so what sort of two-way channels are operating? Yes, and whether, when it's contemporary, it's contemporary to the now rather than contemporary to, I mean, 50 years ago, I mean, in a sense. So is there a, is there a sense in which contemporary art outside of the Aboriginal mm -hmm. sphere well, has, has influenced yes. the creation of Aboriginal art itself? Well, I do mean to yes. I mean, there's several, several yeah. points to that question. I mean, one of, one of them is, like, I, I would think fairly little influence Directly, I would say you know I would say it's very unlikely that Robert Thomas was thinking about abstract art uh, in the, the Euro-American sense when he was making, or any of these artists. I mean, they live in extraordinarily remote places. Um, however, the market perception of this work has, has definitely been influenced by that, uh, and in fact, you know, many of the people who um, most uh, admire Aboriginal art of people who, who, who have a deep commitment to modernist painting and they do uh, try and insert it into um, that, that history uh, as though you know, Aboriginal artists um, you know, uh, took on the mantle of, of formal painting uh, in, at precisely the moment, I guess, that formal painting fell in a heap in, 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 in Europe and America. Um, the problem, I think, with that is that that's looking at Aboriginal art through a very Western lens. And I think what Aboriginal art is asking you to do is think differently about those same questions. So I think that Aboriginal art is, um, you know, I say it's an occupying force. I think that, you know, Will is an example of somebody or myself who have been thoroughly occupied. I think that, um, you know, we've drunk the Kool-Aid, um, but the Kool-Aid is there. They're presenting it. Like, they're, they're offering it. It's not, you know, we didn't, we didn't have to steal the Kool Aid. It was, um, it's presented there, and I, I, I guess that you know what one of the things that makes it contemporary makes it such a contemporary, uh, uh, makes it uh, so appealing to the contemporary worldview is that it is trying to do that. It's trying to cross worlds. Um, you know, this modernist work, uh, I think, is very hard to understand in any other context than than in, in modernity. Whereas I think this one is is actually actively trying to cross worlds. Uh, I think that. Um, I think that's what defines contemporary, con makes it contemporary. You asked about contemporary being related to the now. Well, I um, I subscribe to um, um, to the to the belief um, um, posited by Ian McLean that Aboriginals invented contemporary art. Um, and I, but I go further. I, I have a date. They invented it in April 1912. Um, do you want the exact date? I think it was like the fourth of April 1912, and they invented it. The very second that Aboriginal artists started saying, hey, wait a tick, we should paint stuff because if we paint stuff and give it to these white fellas, they might begin to realize that we see the world differently to them. And that's the moment that contemporary art is born, in my mind. Other comments? Yes, ma'am. I just have a pretty straightforward question. Uh, the word dreamy represents a very complex <coughs> idea but I read somewhere that it exists only in English. And would you know who came up with that word and what do the Aborigines call it? Okay, the, the, the concept is fairly broadly distributed throughout Australia. Um, and so because there were originally over 500 language groups 
in, in Aboriginal Australia pre <coughs> time. There are a lot of different words for it. Um, I don't even... Narangari. Narangari, right, is, is, would be Rover's word for it. Um, Kathleen Bajara might call it the Jukaba. Uh, John Mahawindul would call it Wama. Um, and dreaming um, is not terribly popular translation for the Aboriginal people. If, if you asked Aboriginal people what they mean by Jukaba or Wama, they would say law. They would say business. Um, it, it represents the way in which things are. It is sort of um, the eternal verities. So we don't know who coined the word. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. It wasn't. Uh, was it Was it Spencer and Gill? Didn't it come out? Uh, of? Uh, I think it was earlier than them, but it's certainly in currency right in the early. Early 20th century, and interestingly, I mean, some of the some of the concept, you know, Jukapa and, and Narangani, <coughs> for, uh, in the Kimberley encompass the whole thing. But some communities have have multiple words, so some will have a, a word for the creation time, um, uh, whereas the, the kind of more philosophical thing has a has a different name. So they, you know, there are there are regional variations as well. Uh, but dreaming, you know, in dreaming. Dreaming is, is, is a problematic translation, but it, it, it's kind of evocative as well. It does sort of strike to the point. It's based on the, uh, a lot of it on the legends and uh, uh, storytelling as well. Well, you know, again, there are these instantiations of um, of the law, of the way that the world works, and the earliest instantiations of them. Um, you know, very simply put, a, a sort of parallel, if I can use Genesis um, as, as, a, as, a, as a parallel, um, that these, these ancestral beings, these beings of immense power, rose up out of the ground and and brought the world into existence. They they sang, and and the landscape was formed. They walked across the landscape and left marks on it that we can still see today. Uh, in in Yomu, um stories, two sisters landed on the coast and they had a stick with them and they put that stick in the ground in order to create a well or a water hole that still provides fresh water on the beach there. And when they left the stick in the ground, it became a tree that flowered. And that tree, in many ways, exists today. The tree that you would see if you were walking on the beach at Galambara is certainly different from the tree that was there 2,000 years ago. But they're basically both just different instantiations of that, I hate to use the word, archetypal tree, that, that, that thing that happened in Jukabar, in Wanda, in the dream, for lack of a better word. Can, yes, it's, it's a technical question, I guess. Can the evolution of or the history, a history or an evolution of the dot technique be formulated in a brief way? I mean, I do understand the cross-hatching. Uh, it is probably dictated by the materials that were used, but I have been wondering about all these dots. I have never seen as many dots uh, in an exhibit. Uh, I mean, they are, they are, they are stunning. Sure. And there are also contemporary paintings, I mean, really good, I mean, modern, 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 modern paintings <coughs> that use them very precisely and yet not in this same way, but, but in a more modern way. The one with all the many dots that seem to depict space, uh, our space, yes. uh, 
Anyway, okay, so the, is there a, is there a natural history of dot painting? Uh, in Australia. In Australia, well, well, to, to get very um, fundamental about it, um, in uh, the Western Desert, when people perform rituals, um, they paint themselves up, and the men um, will cover themselves with. Um, these, they, they'll create these designs um, by taking small clumps of feathers or vegetable down, uh, round up flower petals, and affix them to their bodies. And actually what they use as a fixative is often blood, their own blood. And so these patterns that get created by these tiny clumps of feather or or vegetable down are are imprinted upon their bodies during a ritual in which they enact they manifest in the world if I can use that word again the actions of the creative ancestors and so what they are doing in ritual and, and we see this in our own rituals as well. The Catholic Mass um, reenacts, it brings into the world in a physical way the body and blood of Christ. In, in the rituals of the Western Desert, they bring in, they manifest to the world the creative energy of the ancestors. Um, and one of the ways in which they do that um, when the men dance in those rituals. The the dots literally fly off them. They they shape them, their bodies, and and the decoration flies out from them. And the paintings, some of some of them, are an attempt to create, recreate in a visual sense that that energy, that power of the Jukapa, uh, bringing it out into our world. The, um, the painting to which you're referring um, actually depicts the flowering of the bush plum. Um, it is, again, a coming out into the world of a life force. Um, that you're seeing in that world. I agree with you. It does look like you're falling into the universe can, when you stand Can I make a point though on the, the evolution? Because I think that you know, I think that if we look at a work like this is the best example I've got here, but um, you know, I think that the, there's also in, in something like Angelina's work, which is just a pure wall of dots, or even some of Kathleen's, um, what you see is um, uh, you know, it is an evolution, and you know, I hate to use evolution because it's such a uh, it's such a modernist term. It's, you know, one of the archetypes of um, progress. Progress. <laughs> but I think that when you look at the early works of desert painting, they are much more uh, they are much more communicative of the landscape. They are trying to, in a sense, represent some elements of the landscape. So here you can see um, uh, you you can make out. Um, things that are meant to be indicative of waterholes and underwater streams, and um, you know, not solely. Uh, they they have multiple. Um, they can refer to multiple things, but there is definitely a, a referential element in that. There is an element in there where you're meant to look at it and, and at least recognise that there is um, some elements of a representation of landscape. Whereas I I think the great evolution, and I think it probably happens after. Um, it starts happening in the mid 80s, but it really takes force after Emily and I, in the, um, who starts painting in 1989, uh, is that they start to recognize that you don't need that communicative element, you don't need that representational element, you just need the, the what I would say, the affective element, that moving enactment of the natural forces. Uh, and so, in a sense, they start to become more kind of dazzling, dazzlingly visual because they're trying to operate on a, on a different, um, uh, 
on a, on a different kind of ontological register, on a different register. <laughs> They're trying to push a different register of meaning to you. They're trying to just move you with visual activity as opposed to necessarily feeling that they have to communicate um, specifics. You know, rather than communicating the specific of the specifics of the landscape, they're communicating its essential power. And I think that is tied up in a way where um, early on you have this, you know, this for shorty, you have this quasi-representational element. You have the water holes and you see the water flowing between them. Um, but the paintings where they abandon that representation um, go back to your original question that the market forces that favor non-representational painting have, ha have played a role in the changing, I won't say evolution, but in the change in the way that the artists choose to present the, the essence, the ancestral culture, the, the stories that they're trying to tell us. One of the interesting things about um, painting from the, from the north, from Arnhem Land, is that originally it was very abstract and non-representational. And that was the way that it was used in ceremony. And in order to make it less ceremonial, less um, pow powerful, because those were, those were dangerous truths that they are revealing in the painting. They made it representational. And then, so if you see the, the earliest examples of this art, it's very geometric, it's very what we would call abstract. When the market first opened up, they stepped back from that and, and made it representational. And then over the years, they have become once again more what we would call abstract, what I'll say is non-representational, or manifestation, direct manifestation of the ancestral power. And, and you know, one thing I'd really stress, because people, people often talk about the market in, impact and making this work abstract, and I, I'm not always convinced that that is um, that is entirely determined. I don't think that, that that is what entirely has moved this work into abstraction. I think a lot of it is um, related to the questions that these artists are posing and the ways in which they are thinking about their works, um, not just circulating uh, financially, but also circulating um, uh, you know, intellectually and, and politically. I think there are political uh, and, and artistic reasons why the artists move into abstraction. I think we, you know, I think these are. Um, these are all you know, pretty strong men and women. Um, I am not convinced that their art has uh, always become more abstract just because of the market. And, and one of the pieces of evidence I would put to that is there are still an awful lot of figurative artists. Uh, and there are a lot of artists who work across the two. Um, we put up a work by Nyapa Nyapa, who is an artist who, who does that. Um, um, George Milperu does that as well. I mean, there's quite a few of these artists who will work across those modes. And I, I think that uh, that distinction between abstraction and figuration is, is really a very Western one. Um, unfortunately, the market has never really taken the figurative work, so it's, it's a hard thesis to test. We've got one last question here. Brian has given you the high okay. side. So. Uh, I just wondered, does all of this mean that these people think of themselves primarily as artists? Do, find themselves as artists? do these people think of themselves as artists people represented here primarily? Um, I think we need to ask that. Yeah, I think that, that um, they, they do think of themselves as artists. They are engaged with the market. All of this is made to be sold. Um, they do think seriously about <coughs> how they use paint to convey a message. Um, but the making of these designs is grounded in something else. Uh, and so it is part of who they are in many different ways, not just the way that we would define 
artist, as a career, uh, as an identity. Uh, it's much more complex than that. And, and um, the last point that I would make is that these artists in this show uh, are the upper echelon. We're not looking here. Uh, it, you know, there are a lot of Aboriginal painters who, who will do one painting every 10 years for the tourist market, but the ones that you are looking at in this show are committed, serious artists building up a serious career, working you know, programmatically on artistic questions. And um, I, I kind of was, um, when I started tonight, I said, you know, it's a very brave thing of, um, of the Toledo Art Museum to put on this show to take a chance on these works and I um, couldn't couldn't help thinking about um, Alfred Barnes, Alfred Barnes, Arthur Barnes, who created the Barnes Museum in, uh, Barnes Foundation in, in uh, outside of Philadelphia. And he was collecting these artists uh, at the turn of the century, um, you know, little known people like Matisse, um, uh, Cezanne, Picasso, Renoir. And he was able to make a great collection of the leading artists of uh, of, of the modern era, because a lot of museums weren't collecting them at that time. Um, you know, the only museum, I think, well, there was very few museums collecting Impressionist work uh, at, at that time. And he was able to amass a collection of all of the greats of early modern art. And really, that's what Will and Harvey have done here. And, you know, it's really astounding that you can come here and see Paddy Bedford, you know, two major works by Paddy Bedford, who is one of the great artists of our time. Great work by Shorty James L. Robinson, one of the great artists of our time. So, you know, the last weekend to see this exhibition, and uh, I'm excited uh, to see it again. Um, but mostly, um, I would like to express my gratitude to Will and Harvey for, for bringing this work out to the United States, because it's, uh, it's, it's been extraordinary to... Well, uh, okay. Um... Boy, that was excellent timing. <laughs> None of this would have happened without Brian Kennedy.